Hello and welcome to the official Scottish Rugby podcast here at the home of Scottish Rugby at BT Murrayfield. With us this week we have former Scotland captain Al Kellogg, Chris Patterson and former Scotland international Lindsay Smith. Plus our very special guest in the studio, Hamish Watson. On today's podcast we chat with Hamish Watson and all things rugby. We hear from Club 15 coach Rob Christie, Greg Laidlaw, Rudy Jackson and much more. Hamish, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm great. All things considered. <laughs> nah, I'm good. Um, yeah, cheers for having me. How is the hand? Obviously, a difficult injury you got last week. Um, how's the recovery going? Yeah, I did my first um, gym session, or I say gym session, I did some rehab stuff for my groin, shoulder, a um, bit of trunk stuff. So that was all right. It was good to get back doing stuff. Last week, it was um, pretty boring. I was just at home and I couldn't do much. Luckily, I had Lucy to look after me. Um, but yeah, very frustrating injury um, on the back of that Montpellier win. Uh, obviously, Edinburgh had such a good run as well. It just it was a bit, um, bit gut into, especially with the Six Nations. What's um, what's tougher, Hamish, not being able to play and train, or not being able to put in your usual hours on Fortnite? Oh, that's, that's too tough. To, <laughs> that's too tough. Uh, probably not to be able to play just because of Six Nations. <laughs> nah, the, for, the Fortnite stuff is. Um, I'm not playing as much at the moment anyway, but obviously I can't game at the moment, which is. Um, a bit frustrating. You could sell it as an important part of your rehab, that kind of finger movement and dexterity in your fingers. You know, you got to yeah. you got to strengthen the muscles in there and play Hopefully. maybe double time. I'll the ask the question when the cast is off. <laughs> Back to the injury, Hamish. The game itself. Do you how did do you know how it came about? How it happened? How did you get that injury? Um, I think it was just from a kick chase, uh, and I just tackled the guy, and it's just one of those freak things. I think Rambo um, tackled him from the other side. And I think I just got my hand caught in the wrong place and it was either, I think, Rambo's shoulder or head and it just, one of those things you do it probably a hundred times in a game, but it just it just happened to break on that occasion. So, yeah, pretty gutting. Did you know at the time, because you popped up on your feet and joined the defensive line and kept going, did you know it was a bad one or did you think it Yeah, was it was one of those things because, I don't know, I've hurt my hand before on your wrist and it like sort of cramps for a bit and it's sore. And initially it was that, but then when I started trying to move my fingers, that's mm-hmm. when I knew it was... It was pretty bad because it started clicking and um, it still like sort of started falling out of place a bit. So that's when I knew it was pretty bad. Hamish, you mentioned it was Rambo, one of those freak kind of things. You said Stuart McAnally. Has he mentioned to you at all? Has he, has he got in touch and said apologised, or is it one of those ones where you just kind of it's just you got on with it? Uh, I don't. I didn't actually speak to Rambo about it because initially I thought it was um, Jim, Jim Ritchie. So I was like, <laughs> after the game, cheers, Jim. And then I think he was the one who went and checked the footage and was like, no, nah, it was Rambo, it wasn't me. So uh, I think he's trying to make himself feel better. I've got a question around that. When you, you mentioned it, Mossy, when you know we saw Hamish go back into the defensive line. You know he was prepared to you know to defend. And I remember two years ago with with Greg in Paris, the same situation happened when he hurt his leg. He was still continuing to play. Now, as you guys as ex players, is it just within your well to get up and do what you can even though you know you can't play on or is it kind of instilled in you from a team perspective is it more a personal thing or a team thing that um a bit of both but ultimately you're at the they can call it how bad the injury is you you always want to get up you always want to get on with it and try and fill in there was a chain of thought at one point that you know you, you can't be injured in the defensive line so no matter what get up and fill in and that's good in some respects obviously but other more serious injuries there's no way you can get up but I think you want to get up the last thing you want to do is go off the field um, and you want to I mean if, if you can get up and fill a hole you can't hope the ball doesn't come towards you you're going to have to make a tackle but at least you're filling the field you're showing the picture of the defence but uh, it's probably a bit of both but it's either in you or it's not Al you were in uh, Orkney this week how was that for you? I was it was great fun it was over on uh, over on Thursday um, various different school visits at the sports awards Sports awards were brilliant. It, they, it was only a couple of hours, um, but they had the kids in as well. So like, best parts of the night, but the gymnastics coach who had uh, uh, only started the club eighteen months ago and won over one hundred and twenty medals for the kids. When she won the award for the best coach, the, the cheer that went up from the kids that were there was brilliant. So now it was, it was a great trip. The rugby club uh, didn't have the result they wanted at the weekend. St Boswell's travelled up and beat them, but I tell you what, they do it the hard way. Uh, Orkney every second away game they're leaving on Friday nights and back on Sundays, but. It's a great club uh, full of brilliant people, so I very much enjoyed it. Let's move on to the, the games at the weekend. Lynn, were you at the Glasgow Warriors Ospreys game at Scotston? Yeah, Glasgow did well, um, ground out a win and took some four points that were pretty important for them. So um, I thought Brandon Thompson, he played really well. Um, I think he was man of the match as well. 
um, but yeah, no tries to <laughs> celebrate. But. I thought it was, I don't know, I just watched it on TV, I couldn't make it along, Lindsay, but was the wind so strong that actually it ruined the game in terms of, yeah, when you play into the wind it's difficult, you have to you know, change your, your patterns of play, but it was probably too strong even to play with the wind. The ball was blown away for the you know, the attacking team kicks were going too long. It probably it was one of those nights where it was too windy, it disrupted the whole game. Yeah, it was definitely windy. Yeah. I can definitely vouch for that outside with uh, primary fours <laughs> uh, playing. It was pretty icy. But um I think for Glasgow in the second half when we had that mm. uh, penalty pretty far out, I think that actually helped us. Yeah. Um but it went behind us. But yeah, um I think for the kickers it was a pretty hard day for them. Scramble defence was good as um I can't remember who made the break, Nick but Nick Frisbee. Frisbee made the tackle just yeah. before half time. So to go and play into that wind only three 0 down was, was pretty good. So Scar- I thought Swinnell was good as well. I don't know if you guys saw it, but Swinnell was a big dot, shift. Yeah, Swinnell was terrific. The uh, the cover tackle you're talking about before half time that's Cree. Like Ospreys were, they, they should have had more out that first half. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was a big enough win that they should have been 10, 15 points. Something that they missed missed two kickable penalties as well. But credit to Glasgow in the second half in a game, like, they talk about winning ugly. Uh, Kenny Murray came out and said, and well done to Kenny Murray as well, who took over as interim head coach from Davies away his, his son's wedding. Um, that was a big week for him. Um, he t- I think he described it as a doer game, uh, which is a good Scottish word. But I don't think it was, uh, I don't think it was one that uh, anyone would be rushing back to watch the highlights, but a great and important four points. After the game, we heard from Rudy Jackson. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty exposed. Um, Definite tale of two halves. I think the, the first half we were just it was all about holding on. Um, they naturally had all the pressure with the wind. It was hard to get out and and the b- slippy ball as well. It's hard to actually keep ball and and, and create pressure from our side. So to go in three nil was uh, felt like a, a little bit of a win for us. So we knew we had the the, the wind second half and we controlled it really well. And Brandon's kicking a goal and and to touch were, were excellent. Did you think it was just like it could be a penalty or a couple of penalties in it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, kept trying to get myself back in the pocket for a drop goal but <laughs> never quite came I was gutted but um but no, so yeah it was always once we got about 50 60 minutes in we knew it was going to be a couple of couple of penalties probably in it um if we could sneak a try it'd probably pretty much seal the game unfortunately we were just just came short a couple of times but um yeah to get get the win was the, the important thing was that the strategy at the start to play into the wind yeah I think so uh can never fully trust weather reports, but it was meant to get a bit windy as, as the game went on, and uh, and it did thankfully. So, um, thankfully, Rob won the toss, and, and we got got to play the way we wanted. A win's a win. It's another four points, and a big win gets us back onto winning ways in the Guinness Pro 14. Yeah, definitely, we needed it, and uh, with uh, Ospreys right on our heels, it was uh, a bit big thing to cause a bit of separation there. So, um, got a little bit of a break now, rest up, and then we'll uh, tear into it for the rest of the, this international period. Rudy Jackson there reflecting on the Glasgow Warriors' 9-3 victory over the Ospreys. Let's move over to Edinburgh now. Uh, Hamish, you watched that game. I think, did you watch it with, did you see Simon Bergen? Is that who you watched it with? Yeah, that's right. Bergen came around to my house. Um, it's obviously pretty pretty disappointing going through the game. We had um, on great form, won a seven on the bounce. And uh, I think at 21-13, me and Bergen were saying, you know, we'll, we'll take this result. It's not, been, it's not been great, but, you know, a lot of changes, a lot of the international boys away um, and then obviously with five minutes to go the Kings um, did well to get back into the game uh, so yeah pretty pretty um, bad result in the end out there but I'm sure the boys will bounce back in a couple of weeks against the Dragons at home Mossy are you cast an eye over the game as well it was a bit of a strange strange yeah. end to the game wasn't it uh, it, was, it was a strange game all. it was almost Edinburgh so dominant I mean, Kings actually started well scored a, a pretty good try um, beyond Bass on the internationalist who uh, he used to play in the midfield, playing on the wing. He's got a pretty good try for a chip and chase, and then it was kind of all Edinburgh thereafter. Um, and kind of dominant set piece, dominant scrum, certainly, dominant line out, all the territory, all the possession, but just the Kings just clung on. They just dug in. And I was talking to Hamish earlier on, Edinburgh had to work really hard for their scores. Um, uh, I said the, the start of the second half, Edinburgh kicked off, Kings dropped the, the field to catch the, the kickoff. So there's a knock on, so that's the 40th minute. And um, it took to the 62nd minute to score the penalty try. So in that 22 minute period, Edinburgh were effectively in the Kings 22. Kings couldn't get out. Edinburgh all territory possession. You, you got the reward eventually, but it's so frustrating at the end of the game. When yeah, it was a wonder try to finish it, but the two tries that came in the last two minutes for the Kings were were soft to some extent. So it'll be frustrating for for Edinburgh that one. They're so dominant, but yet 
to lose. I suppose it sums up the Kings, similar to Glasgow when they played over there. They've got the ability to score, like from loose kicks, from turnovers, some exceptional bits of skill. But they're not a, a complete team by any stretch of imagination. But they've got some some pretty sharp players. The, the, the disappointing thing from their point of view is the momentum that had been built up. Hamish, that all through the December, the results have begun in January. Everything's going in a great place, and then no disrespect to the Kings, but for me, that's concentration, especially when you look at the last seven, eight minutes of the game. The, the game was lost, not because it wasn't a good enough team out there to, to win it, but because at times they maybe didn't get the uh, the heads where they needed to be. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I would, and to a certain extent. Like I mean, like Moss said, it, we made it very hard for ourselves sometimes to score points, but it's one of those games away from home where if we would have won that, you might not have looked, you would have been like, no, that's a good win away from home in tough conditions. Um, and yeah, like I mean, like you say, it's um, we did have a good enough team out there. We've still got a great squad, and if you look at that team sheet, I, I was looking at it being like, oh, that's, a, that's still a great team. Like we'll comfortably, we'll comfortably win this, and that's the disappointing thing. And you can say what you will about the ref, but the fact of the matter is, with with um, ten minutes to go, or five minutes to go, and twenty one thirteen, no matter how bad the refs been, you got to you got to shut that game out. Yeah, I suppose what you're hoping for is when you get to the end of the season, you're not looking back in that. And I don't, I don't think Edinburgh will be in a position where that will be crucial. But you don't, certainly don't want to be in there in too much time thinking uh, if only. Well, Benetton, well, Alston and Benetton drew with a kind of couple of main rivals for that that qualification position or the qualification positions in it's a Conference B you're in, isn't it? Yeah, so that, that helps in some ways, but it's yeah. disappointing not to get a win. Yeah, I think it's like two points is there between second and fifth mm -hmm. with Scarlets as well. Mm -hmm. So Really competitive. But from your point of view being a player, even regardless of whether you're injured or not, how how difficult is it for you to sometimes watch these games from home or from the touchlines? Obviously, you want to be out there playing, but as a player, you've got that drive to be out there. Is it difficult to watch you sometimes, or are you just you're right behind the boys? Yeah, definitely. I think all of us get right behind the boys. I think me being injured was slightly different um, compared to some of the international boys who are who have been sort of not allowed to play because they haven't been released by Scotland. I think for them it will be very frustrating because if I mean if they were released by if they weren't kept back by Scotland, they'd have been playing. So. I think it was it's frustrating to watch, and I think I said to Mossy before that's probably the most frustrated I've been about about an Edinburgh loss for a long time. Um, just because, like like Al said, the momentum's massive, and we're on such a good run. You know, we've got another great chance to get a victory in, on the fifteenth, I think, um, against Dragons at Murrayfield. So I think that was the um, the more frustrating thing. But I'm sure we've got the we've got the squad to bounce back, and even with those without the international boys, the boys on holiday last week, the non international boys. Uh, I think they've got a week off now, yeah. Probably just as well. Richard Cockrell might have been putting the boys through the ringer a wee bit, would he? Yeah, I haven't spoke to any of the boys who are out there yet, but I think um, the interview or <laughs> the meeting after the game would have been pretty um, pretty bleak. For your point, just quickly, on, on Cockrell, you know, he's came in, this is his second season. For you as a player, what's it been like working with somebody like Richard Cockrell? Yeah, for me personally, I think it's been, it's been really good. I think the first... The first few months are always tough because it's a new coach and you know you got to prove things to a new coach and he's trying to he's trying to read all the players and um, see what they're about um, mentally physically and and rugby skill set wise you know so you might watch um, a player an international player and have your opinion on him but then when you come into camp it might be or when he comes into training it might be completely different so um, I think the first few months uh, were tough for the boys you know you had to we had to all, all prove a point to him um, and after that, I think you saw what we did last season and this season. We've we built on that, and I think um, I think he's done like like everyone can see an amazing job for the club. Big Bill Matter been nominated for a European Player of the Year this week. Um, we talked about it a wee bit last week, but from your point of view, sharing the back roller from just how good is he? Yeah, he's um, <laughs> he's a hell of a player. Like he's um, yeah, an amazing player. And I said in um, an interview a couple of weeks ago, he's not. It's weird because he's not like a. For, like obviously he does the amazing things that all Fijians tend to do like the offloads and the stuff like that the fancy stuff but then he also it's weird he gets breakdown turnovers which you sometimes don't see he um, if you actually look at his offloads per game he'll only do one or two a game but then the ones he does are the most spectacular offloads <laughs> you've ever oh, seen um, and they go trending all online but he doesn't chuck those offloads or doesn't do his ones that bounce along the ground and you know have the loads of turnovers against his name and he has 20 odd carries a game so he's been he's been an amazing player for Edinburgh an amazing signing um, so I don't know who signed him but it was, um, it was some, it was some, it was some well signing done, yeah. I remember because he came in it was this Olympic gold medal winning 
you know, Fijian player coming in, and I think he kind of had a bit of a quieter start to yeah. to, to his time at Inver. He didn't really, he, not that he was a slow starter, but he didn't really have much prominence until I would say maybe the end of last season, this season. But when you watch him now, he's phenomenal. He kind of reminds me, Lynch, you know, and and Alec Glasgow Warriors when Leone started playing the way he plays with his almost octavus arms. You know, he could just shift the ball. You know, like yourself, Lynch. We when we watched Leone, it was kind of similar, wasn't it? Yeah, and definitely, I think he got the you know the fans on board because he was exciting to watch. and maybe had some rugby f- or non rugby fans starting to take an interest in the game. And when you see somebody like Leone or Big Bill, you know, throwing offloads like that, it's exciting for the younger kids to watch as well. So yeah, I think they do their do us proud. Yeah, nice. I would agree with that. Just at this, when he first came, yeah, mm-hmm. just he um, he was also a bit quieter as well. And as he's he's become louder and louder with the squad, he's just built confidence and he's. He's happier to chuck those offloads and stuff like that, so I think it's it's a co- definitely a confidence thing. That's uh, he hadn't. I think we said this a couple of times. He hadn't played 15s. He's only a sevens player before he got here, so he's effectively mm-hmm. learned a new game. He's got the, the technical skills, but he's having to add the, the tactical element to it. Obviously, his physical characteristics are, are, are exceptional anyway. So he's added. He's effectively learned a new game in two years, and I think that goes back to the last kind of question about Richard Cockrell as well. He must have a big part to play in that. You know, I would imagine the Fijians naturally want to throw the offload, whether it's going to go along the ground or not. But the discipline that the kind of coaching staff and the senior players have, have helped him on, that, as you say, Hamish, one of the best bits of it is it's the right thing to do at the right time, not just because he can do it. Um, so it's, it's a discipline for the coach, a discipline for him to learn the game, play as well as he had, and making such a, a big impact. The, the other one you see as well is that the senior players have a big part in making, which not only is it is a new game, 7s to 15s, but it's these guys are coming into a completely different environment and you certainly saw it with Nico and with Leone when he settled in and felt part of the club part of the city you got the best out of them um, Nico probably a prime example he goes away and then comes back who's who's Bill's big mate who looks after him in, in the squad it's weird I think everyone just gets on with him so well uh, like a lot of the Fijians that come over um, they're all such great guys and so easy to get on with um, He's obviously got a family and he's got two kids now, so outside of the club we don't see him as often as we'd like, I think, because his wife wants him at home looking, helping, looking after the kids. <laughs> but, um, yeah, when he's at the club, he's, he's a great guy to have around. He's always he's always buzzing with energy, always very happy, and um, even in the cold days, which he, I know he struggles <laughs> with. Um, but, yeah, no, he's, he's been a great boy to have around. And like you say, along with the rugby, he was um, maybe a bit quiet when he first came over, and each season he's just personality grows and he's more confident with the boys. But... When he first came in, he was you know, Villami Mata. That's his name, and he was that's what you referred to him in the team sheets and the squad. But now it's, it's Bill Mata. Has been a transition from Villami to Bill. Is that his decision, or is that kind of the players, kind of a friendship thing? I'm not really sure. I'm not sure where Bill came from. I don't, you'd have to ask Bill. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not sure where Bill came from. Hey, Mitch, we've talked a bit about the the on field stuff and uh, you getting over your injury, but I know you've just had a wee girl. She's a few months old. What else keeps you busy away from rugby? Uh, yeah, obviously um, had um, my daughter Honor back in September, or Lucy had my daughter Honor back in September, which uh, which is a, an amazing experience, um, and it's well, obviously it's been life changing. I can't imagine life without her now, um, and uh, yeah, I've just got engaged to Lucy as well in December, so that's obviously a massive part of my life, and. Um, Having honours put a bit of perspective on the rugby and stuff. Um, not being the be all and end all and the most important thing in life, you, you realise that when you have a kid. Um, so that's all amazing. Uh, apart from that, um, I obviously have the Rex Club hats, uh, co owner that with my brother, um, which has been going really well recently. So all all these uh, run down south in Manchester or Nutsford, um, just outside Manchester. Uh, so my little brother obviously works there full time as well. He works full time and then. Uh, we've got a few part-time part-time people there, so that's growing as a business, which is which is great for my brother who does it full time. And um, hopefully, that's something I'd like to. If I'm not doing it full time after rugby, that's something I definitely want to carry on, carry on doing, and carry on helping out. What's your What's your role in that at the moment? How active can you be? Well, that's the thing at the moment. I'm not. He's he's there working day in day out, sort of thing uh, with my little brother. So I I try and help out where I can, whether that's a tiny bit of exposure that I can give to rugby. I think at the start it helped out massively for him because. Um, I sort of like to think that I helped give him like an in into the into the rugby culture. So our first club was Aki's, which is where I was playing at the time, and that was our that was our very first um, club that we did with the hats, which was um, which was massive for us. 
Um, so we, so I was there like at that point, just collecting money off the boys, like collecting cash, and then we we did the hats at the turnaround of about four weeks. Um, so I like to think that that's where I helped out at the start. And we've, I mean, we do so many, uh, so many of the club teams now, and loads of pro teams, and it's not just rugby now. Whereas whereas we start out in the rugby, we do, we do football teams in Finland, <laughs> we do uh, university teams, ice hockey teams. Um, so yeah, it's um it's really growing, and that's um that's great. You you mentioned the uh, I mean your daughter gave you that perspective on on rugby, but the business do that as well. The ability to, you know, coach your daughter on a bad day, uh, uh, training, and then focus on something else. Help you? Yeah, I think so. Player. I think like I don't know with uh, with other hobbies as well. I think it does help sometimes if you had a tough day training or a tough tough weekend where you've got a, you've had a bad loss. I think you do need stuff outside of rugby to to switch your switch off. You know. I think when you're younger, it's just all rugby, 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 and you know that's all you want to do. That's all you want to think about. Um, and I think you do need those things um, outside of rugby, and it also keeps you keeps you motivated as well with the rugby stuff. If you can, if you have that ability to be able to switch on and off, um, I think that helps. Actually, helps with your rugby. That's what I found this season, anyway. So I, mean, I mentioned Fortnite right at the beginning, but yeah, you do enjoy your gaming, and there's a few of the boys you. Be just the same as you putting in a few hours, but I assume that the gaming has dropped down the priority list now. It has. It's dropped to probably, on average, thirty minutes a day. Probably. I mean, I, I get the odd two-hour session in when Honor's gone to bed early, and I get a good two-hour session. But I have to admit, I literally jump on, I see if boys are online. If boys are online, I'll be like, right, I've got thirty minutes or something. And then if they're not, I'll turn it off. Whereas before, I would have played on my own and waited for boys to come on and play with me, sort of thing. You go, you go online, and obviously there's the usual suspects always, always there. Name them, name them. <laughs> Fly bubble boy, <laughs> smoggy scucks. These are all, these are all unofficial names. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to chuck out their real names. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a gaming group, and we all love it. And it's, it is, a, it's a great way to turn off. But definitely the hours have um, dropped since Honor. It was exactly the same uh, back when I first started. It was Scott Murray that used to drive it. Scott Murray loved his gaming. In, in fact, Scott Murray bought Andy Kelly an Xbox 360 because Andy was waiting to end in a month still to get paid to buy it and Scott couldn't wait because he needed Andy to play so he <laughs> took him in the shops and bought him an Xbox 360 I think I even game with Andrew Kelly I think back in the day because that not, was a- not a big one for you Moss you ain't never really been a gamer no no much rather get out and climb a tree <laughs> <laughs> I've not got the patience to sit in front I need to be active it was massive active. when my first year at the club yeah. it was massive remember, all the boys hey. there used to be 16 of us online and then obviously in Call of Duty back then yeah, it was, you could only do max lobbies of 8 so boys were waiting and then us young boys would wait for the guys wives to come home and then that would be our that would be our in because they would have to go and we'd be in for the late night sessions it used Much. to be names up on the whiteboard wasn't it <laughs> yeah. what time you start and yeah, where you that's uh, right. that meant nothing to me I have no idea what was going on Much uh, game and go across there mate you, you, you few of the Glasgow boys get involved in your group so well it's funny actually because all the Glasgow boys so in camp we all do a bit of gaming together but all the Glasgow boys are PS4 and all the Edinburgh boys are Xbox so um, now we don't deliberately we don't, is we that, don't, is that, is nah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know it just works out like that but so we don't um, now we don't game we so, don't game together so looking further ahead then and I won't wish your career away you've got many good years ahead of you but you talked about hopefully being able to take on a business full time by the time you finish yeah I think we've just got I mean, hopefully, we've got to see where it's at. If it continues to grow and Gus needs me to work full time, and that's what I want to do, then um, definitely that's an option. I think, um, yeah, I think if it's going really well, that's that's probably something I would like to do. Um, and just hopefully, it's still growing. Any any interest in, in the coaching side of the game? It's weird because I don't I don't have my badges and I don't, which I probably should go and get. But I do um I do coaching outside of rugby, but just the odd session. I don't work full time with any of the teams or part time with them like I don't go down to Aki's but I do I do the odd training session um when we have touring sides up here and I do really enjoy it. Um whether it's something I want to do full time, I don't know right now just because you know when when you play at training every day and I, right now that's not what I'm thinking of that's not where I see myself um coaching. But you never know at the end of my career and if I still am enjoying those rugby sessions, um it might be an option. I was in a, as we chatted about earlier I was in Orkney for four days and every single Visit I did the first question or one of the first questions was who's your best mate in rugby? So who's your best mate in rugby, Hamish? It's tough. Oh, I can't say my best mate. We've got we've got a lot of crew we hang out with. A lot of the old a lot of the older guys who have been at the club for the same time as me. So we I mean it's my eighth season now, so Stuart McAnally, Tom Brown, um, Gilco, uh, Bergie's been around Edinburgh a long time now. Um 
so a lot a lot of those guys um, and then but the good thing about Edinburgh is we'll get on with our, well with all the young guys as well so so anybody, anybody, I'm going back to the Glasgow Edinburgh rivalry. Any good friends in Glasgow? Let it go, Al. Let it go. <laughs> Any good friends in Glasgow, and then you play for 80 yeah. minutes, and it's uh, everything's forgotten. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I've, when you're in camp, I get on well with all the Glasgow guys. They're all great guys. Um, it's when you've got the Edinburgh jersey on that you, that you don't tend to get on too well with any of them. Um, but yeah, I've got I've got a few really good mates at Glasgow. I get on really well with Wills, um, and I speak to him a lot outside outside when you're not in camp. Let's look over to um, under twenties and club fifteen. There was a, there was a game at Orium last week between the club fifteen under twenties. Uh, a result for the club fifteen boys over them. Did you see the game? Ross? Yeah, I went up. Um, quite a few changes actually. The uh, the club fifteen was uh, you know a strong squad, but not everyone was available to play. Likewise, the the twenties used uh, a fair number of players. They played thirty minutes each way inside at the Orium, and it's a really useful exercise for for both teams. Really, it's good. Um, they do it every year in preparation for the, the under twenty six nations and also the club international team. Is they they don't they only play twice a year, so they don't you know get to know each other particularly well. So I hit out that was good. It was uh, it was a bit scrappy. Um, twenty scored first, and then the the physicality of the the club international team put them in a good position. So worthwhile. The club international play this weekend on Friday night at Myerside uh, against Ireland, and obviously the twenties mirror the, the the six nations as well. So. Um, Important games for for both sides, but last week was yeah, certainly the platform. But I, I'm not sure how closely represented the teams that will start this weekend were were represented uh, last Tuesday. After the game on Tuesday, Ben Fox caught up with head coach Rob Christie. Rob, good run out for the boys today. Yeah, no, it was good. Just uh, it was good to get a look at everybody in a live situation. You know, you can train as much as you want, but until you get get into the kind of real situation and things are moving a lot bit quicker, you, you're not quite sure what you've got. Um, so no. I, Reason pleased. Uh, it, was, it was good to actually have a look at a combination of people and individual players, to be fair, and, and get a little bit more detail on them. And um, under twenties, they they gave you a good game, but um, but you boys were up to the task. Oh, look at yeah, look, that's what the twenties were very good. You know, they're young, some young boys there, and they got they got real stuck in. Their physicality is pretty good, as was ours. Um, so so in, in respect to that, so it's pretty good. And, you know, there'll be areas to work on, like, like obviously we've got loads to work on, but, you know, on the whole, it's, it's pretty pleasing, to be fair. And um, so sort of running up to next weekend against um, Ireland, the preparations been going well? Yeah, no, look, we've, we've, had, uh, we've had three sessions in here. Unfortunately, quite a lot of the boys that have attended those sessions weren't able to play tonight. So, as I said, we were able to look at some individual players and, and get a little bit more kind of detail and information on them. Live, which was quite nice, and obviously for myself to be able to work with some other players from other clubs, you know, you get to know them a lot better. So, um, yeah, there's obviously some boys that are going to be playing in the, in the Premiership this weekend, and, and we'll see the fallout from that, and then we'll have to select our squad that's going to take on Ireland at Oxonians. This isn't your first rodeo, you've um, done Club 15 before. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the sort of format of the Dalriada Cup and, and what that means to you? Yeah, no, look at for me it doesn't matter what I'm doing like I keep to work at the highest level possible and I really enjoyed this last year and I've really enjoyed it so far this year um, as I said you're working with different people and you're learning new things as well which is which is quite nice as a coach but for, in respect to the players a lot, this will be the highest a lot of these players play you know in relation to the level um, and you can see it when we all get together there's a, there's a real good atmosphere within the squad and quite a lot of the squad are returning from last year so you know they'll definitely be looking to back up the performance from last year but likewise Ireland will be looking to put down a marker um, obviously the format's a little bit different this year where there's, it's week to week which is actually really good because uh, you know we'll know exactly where we're at on the back of the first game which is at home this time and then we go across to Dublin for that second game and, you know, it's it's a tough place to go across the island, but you know, look, we'll, we'll get stuck in and hopefully put the best foot forward. Scotland sevens in Hamilton, New Zealand at the weekend. Anyone catch the games? It sounded like we put in some good performances. So some individual did really well. So Robbie Ferguson was it eight tries over the weekend. It was eight tries indeed, Lynch. Eight tries. Yeah, a great result for him. And Scott Riddell uh, achieved something, didn't he? Quite. Quite great over the weekend. Yeah, seventieth tournament, which is a, an incredible achievement, really. If you think of how demanding sevens is and how how you know explosive and quick the the players that come into that kind of game year on year on year, for somebody to be in for so long and be so still influential in his leadership and his 
his fitness. It's, it's brilliant for Scott Rodell to seventy uh, seventy two tournaments and well six games obviously. So they won two in day day one, two in day two wins against France, Kenya, Australia, and Samoa. Lost to South Africa in day one, and then the cup quarter finals against USA, which the like they fell nineteen nil behind, and the guys came back to nineteen fourteen with a a late try chalked off at the end, I believe. So it could have been better, um, but uh, I, yeah, positive. I'd say a positive weekend in, in the sevens. Hamish, you've got some experience playing Scotland sevens. Looking back at your time when you, you first came here, you were essentially contracted to sevens. Is that right? You, you played in a few tournaments. It was um, it was a dual contract back then. I think so. I played a bit. I think I played like four games around that year, and then did four um, did four um, circuits as well. So I went to New Zealand uh, to do Wellington, and Tokyo. Hong Kong and Vegas, so I got a few good trips in, and um, <laughs> no, I wasn't not, not bad. Rubbish, yeah. I wasn't the best sevens player back then. I mean, we were all pretty young, and it, it was very different to what it is now. I think if you'd go and play in that now, it's an amazing. Obviously, it's an amazing opportunity either way. But the team now, they're getting to quarterfinals, um, and they're getting they're getting better and better year on year. You know, it's a pro it's a pro setup. You got pro players out as well. Back then, we only had maybe two pro players. Uh, it was made up of academy boys like myself, and then. A lot of club players, um, and we only train maybe twice a week. The club boys came in on a Wednesday night, so it was. It's not like it is now. Um, and I mean, I remember losing to I think the Fair Islands and once. So a little cook, was it? No, it was a Cook Islands or something. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it was. Um, we yeah, we. I mean, we we had a few good victories, but there weren't there weren't many in us. And if you actually look at our squad, we had a few great players there as well. But um, yeah, it was something I'd love to try again. It's just trying to. I don't know if I'd be good enough either. <laughs> After all that, what players were you? Were you, you mentioned the squad. But what other players were around you then during your time in the sevens? Uh, so it was uh, Andrew, Scott Riddell, Andrew Turnbull. <laughs> Scott Riddell was still there, but Scott Riddell was still there. Andrew Turnbull, um, Budgie. Um, go on, Greg. Go on, Greg. How many tournaments did he play? Oh, he did loads. Mm, he did a lot, yeah. Uh, so they were Colin Gregor and Andrew Turnbull and Scott Riddell. They must have been, I think, pros. three pro guys. We only had three yeah, pros. Yeah. Then it was like uh, me, Sean Kennedy, Sam Adal Klein, Adam Ash, Rory Hughes. So a load of young boys. Sorry if I left someone out, but like it was a lot of young academy players with pretty much near to no experience. That like maybe a few of us had a few pro games under our belt. Um, and then you had um, the club players who came in. Um, so yeah, it was um, it was tough. What? Um, when you look back on that, I mean, you talked about the tournaments you went to and you were in. Where did you say you said you're in New Zealand? You're yeah. in Tokyo. Theater you're traveling Islands. the world. Yeah, <laughs> 19 years old. <laughs> see, when, see when you get the call to say, by the way, you're, you, we need you for for Edinburgh this week. We're, mm. we're, we're playing Dragons away. Yeah. Um, uh, you're not going to go to Las Vegas. Uh, where was your head at there? I mean, it sounds as if the the sevens was a dream for but you boys when you're, I suppose, younger. Yeah, I think so, I think hours. so. It was amazing to do the tournaments, and I was really happy that I went on four amazing tournaments and went to see some amazing places and play some great rugby but I think my end goal was always to play for Edinburgh I think I played one game quite early on so I got like a taste of playing in the 15s and I think I always knew I wanted to play 15s so when and it was different like the academy now you don't train with the you don't train with the main squads whereas back then I was we were training every day with um, with Mossy and all those boys um Mike Blair, Chunk, like all those, all those old lads, like so old you, lads. I think, uh, <laughs> I think that ah, that's what we knew we wanted to do. Um, was Alster, was it Alster away? Yeah, Alster, that's right. I remember yeah. you come off the bench. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So I think that's. I think I knew I sort of wanted to do the 15s, and that's what we, were, we actually trained that. Um, and then you actually went away to the sevens for a couple of weeks, so it wasn't actually full time with the sevens. So, so it's more fifteens are your main stuff, I think. But the sevens made you a better player, made you a better fifteen. Oh, definitely. Player. Like skills wise, I think. I could do a few things pretty well, but apart from that, like my probably my core skills weren't too great. I mean, I could always I'd jackal and you know carry hard and stuff, but actually sevens just develops so those those things in your game that you really need, like the passing and just one on one one on one tackle. I remember I played New Zealand and it was I think it was Tomasi Tharma. I flew out of the line and he just stepped me and ran the length of the field. And I think <laughs> that was one of the most embarrassing moments <laughs> of my career. Um, and it's just little stuff like that. Your your tackling needs to be so good. Um, and your um, your detail and stuff. So I think it does make all these players so much better. You score any tries? One against Uruguay. <laughs> nice. Was it a good try? <laughs> it was horrific. <laughs> <laughs> it was How just, was it horrific? I think they had maybe like two guys in the bin and it was just an overlap <laughs> and I just trotted it in from a metre out. I would like to think if I did it now I'd be a bit better.
Yeah, let's move across now to Scotland Women. They open their Six Nations campaign this week as well. Lynn, six excitement in the squad building up to the first fixture? Uh, yeah, I think they're really looking forward to the start of Six Nations. It's like a special time of the year for the girls. Um, it's that time of the year that they all kind of aim towards. Um, but yeah, they've got Italy first up, which they played in the autumn test as well. Um, Italy were a wee bit stronger, um, so I think we'll be hoping to turn that around this time. You've recently announced your, your your retirement from 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 rugby. I like to call it hanging up my boots. Uh, hanging up your boots <laughs> makes me um, sound old. This will be your first time watching, you know, the team playing in, in in the Six Nations. What's your feelings towards that? Is it mixed emotions or kind of relief? Or what are you, what are you gonna be thinking about? Uh, yeah, like a bit of mixed emotions. Going to miss it. Um, spent a lot of time um, within that setup and aiming towards the Six Nations every year. So yeah, I'll be one of their chief supporters, but uh, yeah, taking a bit of a step back and trying to look at different ways to, you know, stay involved with it. The voice of BBC Alba. Yes, I am this weekend. There we go. <laughs> Me and Hugh Dan. It's a, big, it's a big Six Nations for the women for the qualification ahead of the yeah. World Cup as well. Like, yeah. Crucial that they, uh, they get good results. Yeah, like I think um, playing at Scotson as a home um, for them now is, you know, it's really important to them that you know the crowds are they're big and they're noisy and um, I think for a long time we didn't have a regular home um, or a stadium that we could call our home which we do now um, so I know speaking to some of the girls um, from the autumn test against Canada and um, just the support from the crowd was huge so if you're at a loose end next Friday get yourself along to Scotson um, I'm sure the girls would love to hear you there so brilliant do they uh, do the Italians have any professionals not as far as I know. But they're quite strong as a unit, aren't they? The last yeah, they're quite strong. Yeah. Um, they're ranked seventh. Yeah. Um, and we're eleventh. And we're eleventh at the moment. Yep. Yeah. Um, they've come on a lot mm. in the last few years. With regards to the women's game, we can exclusively announce that Jasmine Paris, who recently became the first woman to win the two hundred and sixty-eight mile spine race, billed as one of the toughest endurance contests in the world, will be delivering the match ball at Friday night's Scotland women's game at Scotland versus Italy. Lynn, she's an inspiring woman who hopefully can inspire Scotland as they take onto the pitch. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think it's great that she's going to be presenting the match ball. Jasmine, yes, she won the spine race, which is 268 miles. Um, she beat 136 other competitors, but um, she also smashed the men's record by 12 hours. Um, while she was doing all of this, she uh, breastfed her child as well. So um, pretty inspiring. <laughs> um, What's a spine stuff. race? Um, it's like an ultra running race, so she ran for over eighty three hours. Eighty three hours. Yes. So um, and yeah, so express so milk at every uh-huh. stop along the way oh, for her fourteen month old daughter. That's pretty impressive. Let's look over it now at the ten inch Premiership. There were some good, good results. Uh, Curries and Aki's Moss. They had some big wins, didn't they? Yeah. Um, Penultimate round. There's only one more round of fixtures. It uh, takes a break until the, I think the second of March, the, the final round of games. So, top four obviously qualify uh, for the playoffs. One and two home playoffs against three and four. So, as it stands at the moment, Ayr are first, Carry second, Heritage third, Melrose fourth. So, last week we said the big game or the, the one of the, the focus games was at the Green Yards with Melrose versus Carry. Uh, Carry came out in top thirty one ten away from home down at the Green Yard. So, say so leap, leapfrog up to, to second. Um, and as you say. Edinburgh uh, got a big win at home against Watsonians. Edinburgh are uh, the foot of the table, tenth at the moment, but it's a, a really big win for them against Kenny kind of City rivals. Um, Paddy Dewhurst scored a hat trick for Ayr, a guy who played under twenties last year, full back, really quite sharp, elusive, good feet. He's got a cracking hat trick for Ayr. They beat Glasgow Hawks uh, 36-10. Uh, Hoyk lost out of Stirling 25-12, um, and now they're all Edinburgh game here. It's beat Barramuir 35-14. So. It looks like, well, the top four is Ayr, Curry, Heritage, and Melrose, depending on the order, uh, will come to the last round of games. But uh, Ayr certainly at home. Hamish, Ed Marakis, your team? On the Bukes. That's me. <laughs> on the Bukes. So <laughs> <laughs> that is Hamish hitting the mic there. Again. Again? Uh, so that's your team? Yeah. Played yeah. for them uh, when I first came over under Simon Cross. So he went after in the 20s. Uh, when I wasn't playing for Edinburgh or Sevens, I'd play for. Aki's and then I played there for maybe three years um, off and on until I started consistently playing for Edinburgh so. Big win for Aki's that yeah. yeah Local Irish Watsonians could still have made the top four but because they, they lost out um, they can't now so big win uh, and they're, they're at the foot of the table 14 points 
a hoiker second, but I'm on 19, um, and I say one round to go. So, uh, the well, we don't know what will happen next year in terms of relegation, but mm. uh, as it stands, the bottom team's relegated to second, bottom plays the, the second place uh, from the league below. So, we'll see what happens there, but certainly a big win for, for Arkies. I think they can, they can they still catch Hoik, I think they can, aren't they? Like yeah, five, five points, points in it, aye. So, the last game round of games, uh, Hoik at home to Heriot and Edinburgh Arkies are away to, to Curry. Richie Gray got 55 minutes at the weekend there, Al. Would you, would you make of that? Great to have him back. He's, he's had uh, a, a poor run of injuries in the last, last couple of years, but I'm sure Greg will be keeping a close eye on how he came through that game. 55 minutes is a good amount of time to get back after after so long out. Now, a fit Richie Gray will add to, add to any squad. There's a lot of competition in that position already, but uh, I'm sure that they'll be looking to try and get him back involved as, as soon as they can. Did he start and get 55 or...? Yeah, yeah, he started. No, that's, yeah. Good. that's good. So he's fit enough to start, and uh, see, it's good to hear. We spoke about him last week when yeah. we looked at the, the kind of Six Nations squad and the, the list of injuries, the twenty injuries, um, but two that jumped out that were haven't seen for a long time were Duncan Taylor and Richard Gray. So it's good to get one of those two back, definitely, and others joining the training squad today as well. Um, Fraser Brown and, and Xander Fagerson was announced this morning that they join up with the squad as well. So, yeah, so you got Stafford McDowell, Staff Henry Pargos, and Rory Hughes have all joined yeah. the squad for some training as well. That's good. So yes, a lot of depth there, but best luck to Richie in his recovery. Hopefully we'll see him back in Scotland jerseys soon. Last Wednesday, the Guinness Six Nations launch took place in London and we got up with Captain Greg Laidlaw. Oh, it's always a, a huge privilege to, 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 to be asked to, to captain your country and one I'm uh, really excited about the, the challenge this year and going into a tournament like the, like the Six Nations is, is, is one of the best times to be a player and, and get an opportunity to, to pull on the Scotland jersey and, and run out of BT Murrayfield so we've been training hard and um, you know we're looking forward to the first game when it comes around. It's brilliant to, to know that already the, the stadium's already sold out and I think that's maybe 14 or, or possibly even 15 home games uh, straight in a row sold out so it's incredible to see the support of the nation uh, coming out to support us and it means a huge deal uh, for us as a, as a playing group and uh, you know, and ultimately it's now up to us to, to perform and, and make sure you know that the crowd are uh, making plenty of noise um, when they come along and support us. Mossy, Al, you guys have been down to these launches before. It's a long day, isn't it? And you're uh, a lot of media, but from your point of view, what's the experience like? Uh, it's quite difficult, actually. You, it, it is a long day. You're there from first thing in the morning, uh, and it's the one day where you'll meet more media than you will at any other point in your life. There's split up into print media, into social media, there's radio, there's TV and you effectively move around a, a circuit of loads of different people and, and you get all the journalists from all different kind of journalistic corners uh, whereas usually in the Six Nations or in the rugby season you only get the rugby journalists so it's quite a different experience to, to field some uh, some difficult questions but really important to, to grow the game, um, to bring it to a wider audience and it is a busy day, you're, you're, pretty, you're pretty tired by the end of it because you have to be on it the whole time. Um, but it's good to see the, the kind of messages that come out from you get to meet the other captains and, and coaches and everybody picks each other's brains and tries not to give anything away Al you know him well great to have him there and his captain for Scotland isn't it oh, he's, he's, he's been brilliant and he's captain Scotland more than, than anybody else has and he, the way he leads the team um, I think is fantastic he makes other people around about him play better and he's in a position where there's an awful lot of competition for his jersey um, if you at least three other nines pushing hard but he, he adds things in which at times could be almost classified as unseen. Um, now I generally believe that the back row, and Amos will bring you in on this, but the back row and, and, and 10 and 12 play better when Greg plays. He, he controls a game brilliantly. You've played with him a lot, both um, for Scotland and at Edinburgh. Is, uh, would you would you agree? Oh yeah, definitely. I think, I think you could see last Six Nations when he, he missed that Wales game, was it through injury I think, was it? Or was he? It's in the bench, right? Um, but when him. yeah, when he came back starting, I think you see what yeah, I think you just see what Greek brings. He's he's so passionate about it, and his leadership, his leadership on the field and off it. Um, like, I think it's it's such a big loss when he's not playing and not in that Scotland jersey. I know, and I mean our other nines offer something completely different, which is good as well. Um, so if you've got one of them on the bench, um, and we and we need that, then that's great because it's just completely different. But when I know I'm. I like. I like it when Greg's starting. It's. Um, it's. It's just brings confidence to the whole team. I think in his his leadership skills. Does he ever get angry at you? Have you ever got his wrath? Uh, I'm trying to think. Sometimes he's got that look. Maybe, about yeah. Him. Maybe like 
maybe once in an Edinburgh jersey, maybe. But like, I think, um, I think me and Greek get on pretty well at the moment. So I think it's he's good. It's so, like, he's so influential. It, it, sometimes it's just a look. Like, if there's a mistake made or somebody's not through lack of effort, but if there's a mistake in a, a structure or a system that somebody's in the wrong thing, you just sometimes see him. He's got that kind of look and stare at you, and that's all I need to do because he's so influential. He just has to look at the person. Um, and they're aware of what they have to do to get it right. The other thing that impresses me massively about him is he's adapted his game. Um, now we talked about the other nines bringing a different type of uh, of ability to it, and that's perfectly true. But but Greg's changed to play that Gregor wants the way that Gregor wants to play. He speeded his game up. Um, he'll be looking to be more of a threat with the ball in hand, not to the same extent that an Ali Price or George Horn would be. But he's definitely changed it, and to do that later on in his career, I think is enormous credit to him. And I, I love the fact that he's so passionate. Yeah. You, you can see. Everybody knows how much it means to him to, to be the captain of Scotland, and uh, that's a great guy to have leading you. I think that's massive for the other boys as well, mm-hmm. like just in the change room and stuff like that. When you know it means so much to, to Greek, then I think it just revs all the other boys up as well. There's also the element of when you're around Greek as well, especially uh, if it's in the gym, the changing room, he's got a presence as well. For such a, you know, he's not the tallest guy in the squad, but he's got a presence about him. When he walks into a room, People stand and take notes, and that's what's for Greek. It's not just about what does in the pitch; it's off the pitch as well. I completely agree with that. I think one of the best qualities he's had is what he does off the field. His standards are phenomenal, and he, because of that, he's got the ability to be able to put his finger on anybody's face if he needs to to make sure that they are having the same standards that he has. But he, he does that in all sorts of different ways. You see him working closely with Finn Russell and, and Stuart Hogg in particular over the years, and bringing them through because they listen to him, because they can see what it means to him, but they can also see the the, the, the standards that he's pushing out there. He will be leading the team against Italy at BT Murrayfield on Saturday. Four years ago, Hamish, you made your debut here for Scotland against Italy. Now, it's a game you probably don't want to remember. 28th of February. Was that four years ago? Four years ago here. You yeah. came on as a substitute, number 20. We lost the game and... You got a yellow card, I mm. believe, for it. Oh, brilliant! Oh. But the reason why but the reason, but the reason, but the reason, reason I want to talk to you about this is because obviously I, we all you know want to play with Scott. You guys have done it. I haven't, but you have that dream, and, you, and when you do it, for it to kind of go that way as well, how did that impact you? Obviously, you you've, you found your form after that, but how did that impact you after knowing the circumstances around that game? Um, I think it was. I think it was tough in a way, but actually, I still, for me, it was a weird one. It kind of wrecked the first cap experience, and you see now um, when boys get their first cap and end up beating England and stuff. Obviously, that's the ideal scenario. Blair Kinghorn last year, your first cap, you beat England, you win the Calcutta Cup, yeah. first time in ten years. But still, I think I'm going to remember it as positively as he is, even though I got a yellow card and lost to Italy at home. You know, it's one of those things you've dreamt about your whole life. It's what you've aimed towards your whole life, and I think. Even though we lost to Italy that day at home, and it was no disrespect to Italy, it was a pretty embarrassing loss to lose that way at home. Um, and uh, yeah, like afterwards, obviously, everyone was so disappointed to see people like Greg and stuff um, that disappointed. I couldn't really enjoy enjoy the day. Um, but for me, my whole family was there. It was still an amazing occasion. Um, ben Tulis his first cap as well. I'm gonna chuck him under the bus, and he got yellow card, <laughs> yellow card as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think. Like I say, me and Ben will still at the back of it, and it'll be up there one of the best days of our lives. So, um, yeah, it was, it was still still a great day. But cheers to bring that up. Is your first cap? Is it your first? <laughs> <laughs> well, is it your first cap that stands out for you, or is it the the fiftieth or the hundredth or, or a massive win? Or? Well, the first thing is well, that's your dream, isn't it? Like you you, you can grow up wanting to play for your country, and everything's focused quite right on that first time. Um, so I, yeah. They're really, really special. Really special. No matter what happens, you've earned the right to be there. So, however, it, you know, whether win, lose, draw, or whether you play well or play poorly, or it doesn't matter. It, you've earned the right to be there. And deserve the you deserve, deserve the feeling that, that that you get when you take the field. I, the reason I ask is I, I, the first cap, as, I, as you say, it's incredibly special. But it's my first. I didn't start my first cap. Mm-hmm. So my first start for me out out here actually against France. Um, that almost, when I look back on it, there's, there's, there's more old memories. Uh, I remember that game better as well. Uh, the first cap probably went by in a bit of a blur because it was... Uh, what was yours? Australia? Australia, yeah. Australia. Um, and then the fact, as I say, first start, first start was France and that's probably the one that stands out for me now, looking back on it. And Lindsay, you? 
Yeah, well, my first cap, um, I came off the bench as well. So I think you work so hard to try and get, you know, selected for that first cap. So when it comes, it's a bit, you know, it is, it's nerve wracking. Um, but I think for me, it was, that'll always be a special day. But for me, it was probably my first win in the Six Nations um, because, you know, it, it took a long time to come. But, um, you know, so it was almost a bit of relief as well when that came. Who was you against? Um, Wales. Brilliant. Yeah. I will talk about my first cap because it's irrelevant, but there's still time. <laughs> there's still time. There's still time. Competition time, and we're giving away a signed Hamish Watson podcast mug plus two tickets to the Guinness Pro 14 final in Glasgow. To begin with a chance of winning, head over to our Facebook page and answer our simple question. Terms and conditions can be found on our website. Congratulations to last week's winner of a signed Scotland shirt, Callum McCall, after answering Johnny Gray and Richie Gray as the answer to the question. Jamie stitched me up last week with a gripe, but you know when if you score a try and fans celebrate, if they're sort of know the fans, fans are perfectly entitled to celebrate. <laughs> uh, you're trying to ban the fans. Nobody's allowed, not allowed, allowed to nice. smile, right? Um, no, when the subs are warming up behind the dead ball area, yeah. they jump in the pile up. I said from like a, the defending team point of view, really under masking. Mm. Um, but everybody else seemed to think I was a killjoy and subs on the part of the team. I loved it. I think they, but what, what's it's your an view? opportunity. Um, it's a weird one for me when I like if I score or one of our boys score we all run over and we say well done and then yeah the subs get involved and I think when you're when you're in that in that moment you don't notice so I don't notice you know what I mean you don't notice if the subs come on and run on and pat you on the head because you just you're in the moment of scoring but like, do you I notice could, if the opposite if the opposite yeah, team oh, if the opposition run on I'm, yeah. like you're yeah. losing my yeah. Yeah. Losing not, my that wasn't the point I agree with that that's why I'd do it <laughs> you'd be, do, be doing it to try and get under the skin. Got me. Yeah. Sorry. So well, that's that, that's interesting though. So there's there's two sides to it. So if it's if it's you that's doing it, it's fine. But it's the perception of someone else doing it is when it's annoying. Yeah. That's it's interesting. One of those things, I think, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> if you're winning, everything's great, isn't it? Well, thank you very much, Hamish, for coming down to the studio today. We'll be back next week with more exclusive content here on the official Scottish Rugby Podcast. Thank you for listening.